Yeah, yeah, so you could do that. You could put a Kira the Dawn. You ever heard of Kira the Dawn? A Kira the Dawn, yes. Yeah, yeah. Because you could just listen to a Kira the Dawn tracks. Sure. Eight minute tracks. Yeah. What's a music in the background? <laughs> yes, but then just me is. talking. Yes. Is that weird? N- uh, no. People no, dig it. Yeah, I, I dig it. I dig it. I like music in the back of talking. I like that whole yeah. thing. Well, that's what the good video is, and people love that. Setbacks, failures, delays, defeat, or other disasters. I actually have a fairly simple way of dealing with these situations. It is actually one word to deal with all those situations. And that is good. And this is actually something that one of my guys that worked for me Pointed out to me. He would call me up or pull me aside with some major problem, some issue that was going on. And he'd say, boss, we got this and that, the other thing. And I'd look at him and I'd say, good. One day he was telling me about some issue that he was having. He said, I already know what you're going to say. And I said, well, what am I going to say? He said, you're going to say good. You're going to say good. Something is wrong and going bad. You always just look at me and say, good. Good. And I said, well, yeah. And I mean it. And that is how I feel. When things are going bad, there's going to be some good that's going to come from it. Oh, mission got canceled? Good. We can focus on another one. Didn't get the new high-speed gear we wanted? Good. We can keep it simple. Didn't get promoted? Good. More time to get better. Didn't get funded? Good. We own more of the company. Didn't get the job you wanted? Good. You can get more experience and build a better resume. You're gonna say good. You're gonna say good.
You're gonna say good. You're gonna say good. You're gonna say good. You're gonna say good. 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 You're gonna say good. You're gonna say good. You're gonna say good. 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 And lastly, like to close this out. If you can say the word good, guess what? It means you're still alive. It means you're still breathing. And if you're still breathing, well then hell, you still got some fight left in you. So get up, dust off,
don't know. We don't know. The way the world actually is, is an enormously complex, interrelated organism. The way the world actually is, is an enormously complex, interrelated Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, Shall he not much more clothe you? Oh, ye of little faith. Much more clothe you. Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? Those are famous lines. That's sort of Christ the hippie, right? It's like, hey, let it all hang out, do your thing, and everything will come to you. But that's seriously not the proper interpretation, because there's a kicker with this. And the kicker is this. For your Heavenly Father knows you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Oh, ye of little faith. Oh, ye of little faith. Oh, ye of little faith. Oh, ye of little interesting idea here. It's certainly one of the most profound ideas that I've ever encountered. 
if you configure your life so that what you are genuinely doing is aiming at the highest possible good, then the things that you need to survive and to thrive on a day-to-day -day basis will deliver themselves to you. If you dare to do the most difficult thing that you can conceptualize, your life will work out better than it will if you do anything else. Well, how are you going to find out if that's true? There's no way you're going to find out whether or not that's true unless you do it. You have to be all in in this game. 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 A ye of little faith. 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 interface for reality some of these things you're gonna say hey I've heard about those first you must accept the frame at least as a filter that there could be a subjective reality and that you can can manipulate it you should accept that systems work better than goals people are telling me every day that they implemented systems and it changed their life this is one of the biggest buttons on the interface for life. If you don't like where you are and you want to go somewhere else, learn how to build systems for everything from your diet to your career to your social life, fitness, everything. idea that if you intelligently add new talents, you become not just a little bit better, but exponentially better because talents really explode your capability and your options. So this is one of the biggest, biggest buttons on the interface to reality. It feels like it works. It feels like it works. It feels like it works. To reality. It feels like it works. It feels like it works. It feels like it works. Affirmations, the idea of writing down or visualizing your goals, seems to be something that gives you the impression that it works. And I say that very carefully. Does it work? Do affirmations change reality? I don't know. I don't know. I can tell you that when I've used them, the results that I've gotten don't seem like anything could have been natural. I cured an incurable voice problem. I had ridiculous stock market luck when I used the affirmations. My career, as I told you, is just crazy. The interface to reality. It feels like it works. It feels like it works. It feels like it works. The interface to reality. It feels like it works, but I'm not going to tell you it does. You should see these as filters. If it feels like it works, keep doing it. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. If it feels like it works, keep doing it. 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 The interface to reality. It feels like it works. It feels like it works. It feels like it works. The interface to reality. It feels like it works, but I'm not going to tell you it does. You should see these as filters.
task, and the task is overwhelming. Akira. And I heard the pull-up record was 4,020 pull-ups, and I was talking about breaking this record. People are like, oh my God. I went right to a pen and paper. What are you doing? I'm doing the math, man. I'm doing the math, man. What are you talking about? I'm doing the math, man. I'm open minded to the fact that, okay, if I do five pull ups in a minute for so many hours, I can get so many pull ups in. How much time do I have to rest? I was breaking the math down. You have to be open minded to the possibilities that I can do this. Once you shut your mind down to the possibility that it can be achieved, there's no way it can happen. So that's why my eyes and my body light up about things, because I know that if you're in a fight, you have to attack. You have to keep attacking. The enemy has to know he is not going to give up. The enemy has to know he is not going to give up. He must break the soul, whatever the fuck is in front of him. Whatever the fuck is in front of him. Whatever the fuck is in front of him. Whatever the fuck is whatever the fuck is whatever the fuck is in front of him. The enemy has to know he is not going to give up. He must break the soul, whatever the fuck is in front of him. That's what I realized. I was never breaking the soul of anything in front of me. So that's why I came with this thing called taking souls. I started to devise ways to break a soul of a human being, of an object, of whatever's in front of me. If you keep on attacking something, nothing wants to stand in front of anything that is relentless. Nothing. That's when a lot of stuff started clicking, man. I started watching those instructors on the side. They've been there, done that. Now they're instructing you. They have their parkas on, it's usually cold, coffee, drinking their coffee, and they're beating the crap out of us. And when I started realizing, I started playing mind games. And I was like, you know what? I bet these fuckers are looking at us, judging themselves about when they were going through hell week. About looking at God right now. I was buried. So what I started doing was I got my boat crew. It's Wednesday and everybody's broken, everybody's beat up, man, and everybody's like just kind of just trying to get through Hellwick now. And they tell you how you're supposed to feel. So you are feeling that way. I was like, uh, don't let these motherfuckers tell you how you're supposed to feel. No, it's day one, motherfucker. This is hour one. So I was getting my boat crew all jacked up. I said, we're gonna take these motherfuckers souls. So they had us doing this simple thing that guys were struggling with. Boku 2 was just launching the fucking boat in there, yelling, yeah, you can't fucking hurt us, you can't hurt Boku 2. And I looked on the instructor's faces and it looked like someone had just fucked with their soul. And I looked at my guys in the boat crew and I said, hey, guess what? Those motherfuckers aren't fucking tonight. Cause we own space in their fucking head. We own space, they're gonna think about us tonight. The enemy has to know he is not going to give up. The enemy has to know he is not going to give up. He must break the soul, whatever the fuck is in front of him. Whatever the fuck is in front of him. Whatever the fuck is in front of him. Whatever the fuck is whatever the fuck is whatever the fuck is in front of him. The enemy has to know he is not going to give up. He must break the soul, whatever the fuck is in front of him. And we start fueling off of that. We start fueling off the fact that, man, it takes one second of energy to steal everybody's. And then you have all the energy you need. That's all you need. You need to look at someone's eyes. You know how it is when you fight somebody and you broke that motherfucker. He's like, oh God, man, I don't want to go back to the next round. And you feel like, my God, I can fight all day. That's what taking souls is. But you have to have the will, the heart, the courage to go that distance when you're exactly jacked up, we have nothing left to give. And give more. You know how you get that fight or flight response? When you get to move real quick? I started learning the mind a lot, how to get myself jacked extremely fast. In a horrible environment when everybody's miserable, I learned how to really find strength in the misery. This is where I shine. And I started using all that misery for tons and tons of tons of drive and motivation to then lead people further. Because you can get a lot of power through misery. And once people see that, my God, God, this is fucking going. 
then everybody says, Roger that. I started realizing that if you can just find strength just a little bit longer, you will have a crew of people following you along the way. The enemy has to know he is not going to give up. The enemy has to know he is not going to give up. You must break the soul, whatever the fuck is in front of you. Whatever the fuck is in front of you. Whatever the fuck is in front of you. Whatever the fuck is whatever the fuck is whatever the fuck is in front of you. The enemy has to know he is not going to give up. You must break the soul, whatever the fuck is in front of you. You have to take great pleasure in the fact that no one wants to be where the fuck you're at right now. Great pleasure, man. They have to bring a passion out of you. Has to bring something very, very weird out of you, man. Like, you know, people don't really understand what that is. When you're in the worst environment possible, the worst situation possible, and everybody's looking like God, man, I hope this ends. And you see that. Time slows down and you see that. You're you're feeling that. Everybody has that look on their face like God, this guy. This is where I shine. This is where I shine. Akira, Akira. He start clout. I should make it clear, you know, I don't believe this stuff. I find believing in these high-flown, complicated synthetic systems to come off sort of like pathology. So I entertain ideas. But I don't give belief over what I do. I'm a meme spreader. What what I do? I'm a meme spreader. What what what, what I do? I'm a meme spreader. Meme spreader. A meme replicator. Naturally, this question arose in our group. Why us? Why us? Why are the aliens revealing the unified field theory of space and time to us? And the mushroom just replied without hesitation. Because you don't believe in anything. And that apparently is what's required. Do you all know that Van Morrison song about no guru, no method, no teacher, just you and me and nature in the garden? I think that's actually where it's at. So what I do, I'm a meme spreader. What, what I do, I'm a meme spreader. What, 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 what I do, I'm a meme Spreader, meme spreader, spreader, a meme replicator. And the purpose of these teaching things is to turn you into fellow replicators of the meme, of the meme. Should go forth and tell other people, tell other people, tell other people, go go forth and tell other people, tell other people, tell other people, and copy it into their head, copy it into their head, copy it into their head, and this meme will spread. So what I do, I'm a meme spreader. What what I do. Spreader. What, 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 what I do? I'm a meme spreader. Meme spreader. A meme replicator. Because we cannot evolve faster than our language. The edge of being is the edge of meaning. And somehow we have to push the edge of meaning. We have to extend it. Because if we appear to be confronted by insoluble problems, it's because we have the wrong language for dealing with this problem. You learn that with computers. Certain languages are good for certain kinds of problems. We have to constantly evolve language. 
and push it forward. So what I do, I'm a meme spreader. What what I do, I'm a meme spreader. What what what, what I do, I'm a meme spreader. Meme spreader. Like, hey, man, you have a room. 
have a room. Well, my room's a hellhole. It's like, well, then you're a denizen of hell <laughs> inhabiting it. You should do something about that. Well, what? Well, put it in minimal order. Get your clothes together because you have to wear those. People are looking at your clothes. What clothes should you be wearing? Not the clothes of a total wretched loser. How yeah. about that? Yes. What about your bed? Well, is it comfortable? Do you make it in the morning so it looks like half civilized? Can you sleep there? It's like, is there junk everywhere so you just hate your life when you walk into your room? It's like, clean the damn thing up. See yeah. if you can do it. Order your drawers. Learn to fold your clothes. Put it in minimal order. And then, man, you can get spectacular. You said, put a plant in there. It's like, maybe I could make it beautiful. None of them can hurt me No one can implicate me in ugliness Nor can I feel angry at my relative or hate him We were born to work together like feet, hands and eyes Like the two rows of teeth, upper and lower To obstruct each other is unnatural To feel anger at someone, to turn your back on him These are obstructions Yo, discard your first for books so you won't die in bitterness But in cheerfulness and truth Grateful to the gods from the bottom of your heart Grateful to the gods from the bottom of your heart Discard your first for books so you won't die in bitterness But in cheerfulness and truth Grateful to the gods from the bottom of your heart Grateful to the gods from the bottom of your heart Discard your first for books so you won't die in bitterness But in cheerfulness and truth Grateful to the gods from the bottom of your heart Grateful to the gods from the bottom of your heart Whatever this is that I am It is flesh, a little spirit and intelligence Throw away your books, stop letting yourself be distracted, that is not allowed Instead, as if you were dying right now, despise your flesh A mess of blood, pieces of bone, a woven tangle of nerves, veins, arteries Consider what the spirit is, air, and never the same air But vomited out and gulped in again every instant Finally, the intelligence Think of it this way, you are an old man Stop allowing your mind to be a slave To be jerked about by selfish impulses To kick against fate and the present To mistrust the future What is divine is full of providence Even chance is not divorced from nature From the inweaving and infolding of things Governed by providence Everything proceeds from it And then there is necessity and the needs of the whole world Of which you are a part Whatever the nature of the whole does And whatever serves to maintain it Is good for every part of nature the world is maintained by change In the elements and in the things they compose That should be enough for you Treat it as an axiom Discard your first for books So you won't die in bitterness But in cheerfulness and truth Grateful to the gods from the bottom of your heart Grateful to the gods from the bottom of your heart Discard your first for books So you won't die in bitterness But in cheerfulness and truth Grateful to the gods from the bottom of your heart Grateful to the gods from the bottom of your heart This guy you pass for books so you won't die in bitterness But in cheerfulness and truth Grateful to the gods from the bottom of your heart Grateful to the gods from the bottom of your heart
extensions the gods gave you and you didn't use them. At some point you have to recognize what world it is that you belong to, what power rules it and from what source you spring, that there's a limit to the time assigned to you and if you don't use it to free yourself it will be gone and will never return.
None of that shit happened. I don't know how I dealt with it lately. Over the years, doing all that coke and sitting there alone like a fucking loser and writing about my past, all that shit fucking cleared the air in my mind. I don't know how. I don't know how. When I walk on the streets a little bit sometimes, I go, wow, I remember walking on the street after I did this. Or I remember walking on the street after I did that. <sighs> 30 years ago, I was getting chased in that fucking parking lot. Chased. 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 All I have is stupid memories. I cherish them more than anything in the fucking world. There were no light in it, unless a planet happens to float by. When a planet floats by, there will be light. In the darkness. But if there isn't anything to relate to the sun in that way, then comes no light. Now this goes right down to the root and ground of everything. It goes down to the essence of your nerves, your whole being. That it's all an interdependence. There will be noise. There will be a vibration. There will be light. In the dark. There will be a vibration. There will be light. In the darkness. And that's why one of the basic symbols of the universe is the Chinese yin yang symbol, which you know is a circle with an S curve in the center. One side of the S is black. 
the other is white. So it makes, as it were, two commas or two fishes. And the eye of the fish is the opposite color. The white fish has a black eye. The black fish has a white eye. Curling in on each other. Now this thing is called a helix. And that is the fundamental form of the galaxies. The great nebulae we see out in space. And this is basically to the position of sexual intercourse. This is love making. And this is, you know, when you hold hands and, and so on. This is it. This is it. There will be noise. There will be a vibration. There will be light. In the darkness. There will be noise. There will be a vibration. There will be light. In the darkness. But there are two. It's this fear of discomfort. People have this extreme feeling in their mind when it comes to their associations with exercise. They want to avoid discomfort. They feel like any type of exercise is just like something to be avoided. That's not for me. Fuck that. I don't want to sweat. I don't want to strain. I don't want to sweat. I don't want to strain. A lot of times this association that they have is about the beginnings of getting in shape. It's not about once you're actually fit. Because once you're actually fit and you look forward to it, it feels great. If I can't get a workout in, I look at my schedule and go, I don't have any time for a workout, which means I'm not going to get that good feeling. Get get that good feeling. And so instead of looking at it like, oh, I've got to go grunt and sweat, I'm thinking I'm not going to feel good. I'm not going to feel relaxed. I'm not going to feel carefree. Even appreciative, like my appreciation of things, and it gets enhanced greatly after exercise. I just feel better. I want to sweat. I want to strain. 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 Get that good feeling. Get get that good feeling. Get that good feeling. I'm a sweat, I'm a strain, 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 I'm a sweat, I'm a strain. Get that good feeling. Get get that good feeling. Get that good feeling. It feels great. Most people, their associations are to avoid anything that's uncomfortable. It's so illogical. Discomfort is your friend. It really is. Discomfort, not being happy and content with certain situations in life. They're massive, massive motivators. They're amazing at facilitating change. Yet our instinct is to avoid those and just sit on a couch and watch some fucking reality show. It's bizarre. But when I get really disciplined and really consistent, with my workouts. I almost feel momentum. I feel like there's a push behind me, like, all right, yeah, now I'm doing it. sweat, I wanna strain, I wanna sweat, I wanna strain, I wanna sweat, I wanna strain, I wanna sweat, I wanna strain. Get that good feeling. Get get that good feeling. Get that good feeling. I wanna sweat, I wanna strain, 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 I wanna sweat, I wanna strain. Get that good feeling. Get get that good feeling. Get that good feeling. Yeah, now I'm doing it. Yeah, now I'm doing it. I'm doing it all the time now. I'm looking forward to the next time, and it makes that resistance much weaker, and it makes my motivation and my discipline much stronger. I think a lot of it is based on just the consistency. Blowing something off is not just bad for you physically, it's also bad mentally, because then that option is now available. The option to fuck off, you did it before, and you're probably going to do it again, and you'll get mediocre results, not just in that aspect of your life, maybe in all aspects of your life. That option to fuck off, when you embrace it, that is a pathway that you 
might choose when it comes to dealing with conflict in your personal life, business, business decisions, career decisions, like an uncomfortable decision that you might be faced with, what your pathway is in life, but you don't do it instead, you fuck off. And that inclination to fuck off, that gathers momentum as well. The inclination to be disciplined, that comes with momentum. I think both things, you take a path. I'm a sweat, I wanna strain, 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 get that good feeling, get get that good feeling, get that good feeling. I'm a sweat, I wanna strain, 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 get that good feeling, get get that good feeling, get that good feeling. It feels great. of the fuck off, your body is like a race car that you can juice up yourself. Like you can add the fat tires, you can add improved suspension, you can beef up the horsepower in the engine. You can do all that yourself. Or you could just choose to have this shitty body. No one's under the illusion you're gonna live forever, but you are enhancing the experience that you're currently involved in right now. If you are alive, you do experience this life, but do you experience this life is it as enjoyable as it can be? And we all know that there's a spectrum for that enjoyability. Like we've all had times in our life where it's not been so great. And then times in our life where everything came together like, what a fucking great day, woo! Great day, woo! Great day, woo! Great day, woo! Make more of those! Make more of those! Make more of those! Like you can make more of those! And then the whole thing's better, and then the whole thing's better. And I think when that whole thing is better, it affects Everybody you touch, everybody that's around you, everybody you come in contact with, that in turn, I mean, it sounds so grandiose, but in, in turn can affect the entire race of human beings. from scratch. You must first invent 
the universe. If you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. If you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. If you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. in the most 
most primitive societies already. Nature produces this wonderfully rich being, full of possibilities. The society, and you cannot blame society, it requires a certain specific limited type. It's got to have that, otherwise it can't exist. And so the individual is, so to say, carved in shape. Garified, his teeth knocked out, his body is changed so that he'll know I'm a member of this group, not that group. The individual must be shaped. He must be made to react in the way that that culture wants. The individual must be shaped. He must be made to react in the way that that culture wants. Serotonin levels go up, you're less 
sensitive to negative emotion, you're less impulsive, you live longer, everything works in your favor, your immune system functions better, and you're oriented at least to some degree towards the medium and long-term future. And you can afford that because all hell isn't breaking loose around you all the time. And so then the question is, is there a way of being that increases the probability that you're going to move up dominance hierarchies? Well, that doesn't seem to be a particularly provocative proposition. The same thing as the crucifix. And that has to do with something like the voluntary acceptance and therefore transcendence of suffering. 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 The voluntary acceptance and therefore the transcendence of suffering. Okay, so back to Jung. See, Jung believed that once we had stopped populating the cosmos with gods, that they went inside. Think about it this way. Archaic person looks at the sky, uses his imagination to populate the sky. What's the sky? Well, it's the constellations. It's the domain of the gods. Well, why? Because the gods are what are out there beyond your understanding. Well, that's what you see when you look up at the sky. So you populate the night sky with figures of your imagination. So the gods are the things that you broadcast out of your imagination and see spread over the world. It's like the contents of your unconscious are manifesting themselves when you encounter the unknown. It's exactly what it is. How else could it be? You're projecting your fantasy onto what you don't understand. That's how you start to cope with what you don't understand. You populate the unknown with deity. Where did they come from? They came from your imagination. Well, what happens when you take them out of the world? Do they disappear? No, they just go back into your imagination. That's the same motif as rescuing your dead father from the belly of the whale. Belly of the whale. Belly of the whale. Rescuing your dead father from the belly of the whale. Belly of the whale. Belly of the whale. To be trained to attain those lesser things. The 
Cause you must entirely quit some I'm for now postpone the rest But if you would both have these great things Along with power and riches You'll not even gain the latter Cause you aim in at the former And you'll fail at the former By which alone happiness and freedom are achieved Some things are in our control like that. Now, do you have a reason to be? Yes, you have lots of reasons to be. God, there's reasons to be resentful about your existence. Everyone you know is going to die. You too. And there's going to be a fair bit of pain along the way. And lots of it's going to be unfair. It's like, yeah. No wonder you're resentful. It's like, act it out what happens. You make everything you're complaining about infinitely worse. There's this idea that hell is a bottomless pit. And that's because no matter how bad it is, some stupid son of a bitch like you could figure out a way to make it a lot worse. That's what life is like. It's suffering. That's what the religious people have always said. Life is suffering. Yes. Life is suffering. Yes. What do you do in the face of that suffering? Try to reduce it! Start with yourself! What good are you? Get yourself together for Christ's sake so that when your father dies you're not whining away in the corner and you can help plan the funeral. 
and you can stand up solidly so that people can rely on you. That's better. Don't be a damn victim. Of course you're a victim. Jesus. Obviously. Put yourself together. You know how to do that. You know what's wrong with you. If you'll admit it. You know there's a few things you could like polish up a little bit. That you might even be able to manage in your insufficient present condition. And so you might shine yourself up a little bit and then your eyes will be a little more open and then you can shine yourself up a little bit more and then maybe you could bring your family together instead of having to be the hateful, fightful, neurotic, infighting bats that you're doomed to spend Christmas with. Life is suffering. Yes! yourself up a little bit, kind of humbly, because, you know, God, you're a fixer-upper if there ever was one, and then you got to figure out how to make peace with your idiot brother, and probably not, because he's just as dumb as you, so how the hell are you going to manage that? So then, maybe you get somewhere that way, and your family sort of functioning, and you find out that kind of relieves a little bit of suffering, although it reduced the opportunities for spiteful revenge, and that's kind of a pain in the neck. And so, then you get your family together a little bit, and you're a little clued in then, at least a bit, because you've done something difficult that's actually difficult. You're a little wiser, and so then maybe you could put a tentative finger out beyond the family and try to change some little thing without wrecking it. Our society is complex, and we teach our students that they could just fix it. It's like. Go we'll fix the military helicopter and see how far you get with that. You're like a chimp with a wrench. Wax! Oh, look! It's better! It's like, no! It's not better. Things are complicated, and to fix things is really hard. And you have to be like a golden tool to fix things. And you're not. And that's the other message of the West. How do you overcome the suffering of life? Be a better person. Life is suffering. Yes. Life is suffering. Yes. Life is suffering. Well, that's hard. It takes responsibility. And I think, you know, if you said to someone, you want to have a meaningful life? Everything you do matters. That's the definition of a meaningful life. But everything you do matters. You're going to have to carry that with you. Or do you want to just forget about the whole meaning thing and then you don't have any responsibility because who the hell cares? And you can wander through life doing whatever you want gratifying impulsive desires for how useful that's going to be and you're stuck in meaninglessness but you don't have any responsibility which one do you want well ask yourself which one are you pursuing and you'll find very rapidly that it isn't the majority of your soul that's pursuing the whole meaning thing because well look what you have to do to do that you have to take on the fact that life is suffering you have to put yourself together in the face of that well, that's hard. Christ, it's amazing people can even do it. I'm stunned every day when I go outside, and it isn't a riot. With everything burning.
Fortunes require leverage. Business leverage comes from capital, people, and products with no marginal cost of replication. Give me a lever long enough and a place to stand and I will move the earth. Give me a lever long enough and a place to stand and I will move the earth. Give me a lever long enough and a place to stand and I will move the earth. Give me a lever long enough and a place to stand. Leverage is critical. We all know what leverage is when we use a seesaw or a lever. We understand how that works physically. But I think what our brains aren't really well evolved to comprehend is how much leverage is possible in modern society and what the newest forms of leverage are. The oldest form of leverage is labor, which is people working for you. So instead of me lifting rocks, I can have 10 people lift rocks. And just by my guidance and where the rocks should go, a lot more rocks get moved than I could do myself. Everybody understands this because we're evolved to understand the labor form of leverage. Give me a lever long enough and a place to stand and I will move the earth. Give me a lever long enough and a place to stand and I will move the earth. Give me a lever long enough and a place to stand and I will move the earth. Give me a lever long enough and a place to stand. And so what happens is society overvalues labor as a form of leverage. This is why your parents are impressed when you get a promotion and you have lots of people working underneath you. This is why when a lot of naive people, when you tell them about your company, they'll say how many people work there. They'll use that as a way to establish credibility. They're trying to measure how much leverage and impact you actually have. We just automatically assume that more people is better. But I would argue that this is the worst form of leverage that you could possibly use. Managing other people is incredibly messy. It requires tremendous leadership skills. You're one short hop from a mutiny or getting eaten or torn apart by the mob. It's incredibly competed over. Entire civilizations have been destroyed over this fight. For example, communism, Marxism, is all about the battle between capital and labor. Das Kapital und das Labor, right? So it's kind of a trap. So you really want to stay out of labor-based leverage. You want the minimum amount of people working with you that are going to allow you to use the other forms of leverage. Much more interesting. Give me a lever long enough and a place to stand and I will move the earth. Give me a lever long enough and a place to stand and I will move the earth. Give me a lever long enough and a place to stand and I will move the earth. Give me a lever long enough and a place to stand.
telescope dance and act what has never before been done to push the envelope of creativity and language and what's really important is I call it the felt presence of direct experience which is a fancy term which just simply means we have to stop consuming our culture We have to stop consuming our culture. We have to create culture. Don't, don't watch TV. Don't read magazines. Don't even listen to NPR. Create your own road show. The nexus of space and time where you are now is the most immediate sector of your universe. And if you're worrying about Michael Jackson or Bill Clinton or somebody else, then you are disempowered. You're giving it all away to icons. Icons which are maintained by an electronic media so that you want to dress like X or have lips like Y. This is shit brain, this kind of thinking. That, 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 that is all cultural diversion. And what is real is you and your friends and your association, your, your highs, your orgasms, your hopes, your plans, your fears. And we're told, no, we're unimportant. We're peripheral. Get a degree, get a job, get a this, get a that, and then you're a player. You don't even want to play in that game. You want to reclaim your mind and get it out of the hands of the cultural engineers who want to turn you into a half-baked moron consuming all this trash that's being manufactured out of the bones of a dying world. Where is that at? Where is that at? Where is that at? Catalyst to say what has never been said, to see what has never been seen. Draw, paint, sing, sculpt, dance, and act. What has never before been done, to say what has never been said, to see what has never been seen. Draw, paint, sing, sculpt, dance, and act. What has never before been done, thing I might mention, most writers, and I think it's an unfortunate thing, they try to write something that they think a certain audience might enjoy. I've never been able to do that, because I can't put myself in the mind of other people. only know what I enjoy. So every time I've written a story, I've always tried to write the sort of story that I myself would enjoy reading. The sort of story that I myself would enjoy reading. A story that would interest me while I'm writing it. As
as I'm waiting to find out what happens next. And I can't know what other people think, but I can know what I think. I can't know what other people think, but I can know what I think. And I feel I'm not that unusual. If there's a type of story I like, there must be lots of people who like the same type of stories. Therefore, I have always written to please myself, not to please a certain type of audience, the sort of story that I myself would enjoy reading. The sort of story that I myself would enjoy reading. Because you can't know the audience as well as you know yourself. And if I write a story that I'm enjoying while I'm writing it, and I can't wait to see what happens next, then I'm hoping that a large proportion of the public will feel the same way and they'll enjoy it too. So to sum it up, I have always tried to please myself, not other people. And somehow it seems to have worked because I guess I'm not that different than other people. I've always tried to write the sort of story that I myself would enjoy reading. The sort of story that I myself would enjoy reading. story that I myself would enjoy reading. The sort of story that I myself would enjoy reading. So good luck to you. Thanks for listening. And I really enjoy talking to you. Excelsior. Do you know, Asclepius, that Egypt is an image of heaven? Or to speak more exactly, in Egypt, all the operations of the powers which rule and work in heaven are present in the earth below. In fact, it should be said that the whole cosmos dwells in this our land, as in a sanctuary. And yet, since it is fitting, that wise men should have knowledge of all events before they come to pass. You must not be left in ignorance of what I will now tell you. There will come a time when it will have been in vain that Egyptians have honored the Godhead with heartfelt piety and service, and all our holy worship will be fruitless and ineffectual. The gods will return from earth to heaven. Egypt will be forsaken. And the land which was once the home of religion will be left desolate, bereft of the presence of its deity. Oh, Egypt, Egypt. Oh, Egypt, Egypt. Oh, Egypt, Egypt. Of thy religion, nothing will remain but an empty tale. Oh, Egypt, Egypt. Oh, Egypt, Egypt. Oh, Egypt, Egypt. Of thy religion, nothing will remain but an empty tale, which thine own children in time to come will not believe. Nothing will be left but 
graven words, and only the stone will tell of my piety. And in that day, men will be weary of life, and they will cease to think the universe worthy of reverent wonder and worship. They will no longer love this world around us, this incomparable work of God, this glorious structure which he has built, this sum of good made up of many diverse forms, this instrument whereby the will of God operates in that which he has made, ungrudgingly favoring man's welfare. This combination and accumulation of all the manifold things that call forth the veneration, praise, and love of the beholder. Darkness will be preferred to light, and death will be thought more profitable than life. No one will raise his eyes to heaven. The pious will be deemed insane. The impious wise, the madman will be thought a brave man, and the wicked will be esteemed as good. As for the soul, and the belief that it is immortal by nature, or may hope to attain to immortality, as I have taught you, all this they will mock and even persuade themselves that it is false. Oh, Egypt, Egypt. Oh, Egypt, Egypt. Oh, Egypt, Egypt. Of thy religion, nothing will remain but an empty tale. Oh, Egypt, Egypt. Oh, Egypt, Egypt. Oh, Egypt, Egypt. Of thy religion, nothing will remain but an empty No word of reverence or piety no utterance worthy of heaven will be heard or believed and so the gods will depart from mankind a grievous thing and only evil angels will remain who will mingle with men and drive the poor wretches into all manner of reckless crime into wars and robberies and frauds and all things hostile to the nature of the soul then will the earth tremble and the sea bear no ships. Heaven will not support the stars in their orbits. All voices of the gods will be forced into silence. The fruits of the earth will rot, the soil will turn barren, and the very air will sicken with sullen stagnation. All things will be disordered and awry. All good will disappear. When all this has befallen Asclepius, then God, the creator of all things, will look on that which has come to pass, and will stop the disorder by the counterforce of his will, which is the good. He will call back to the right path those who have gone astray. He will cleanse the world of evil, washing it away with floods, burning it out with the fiercest fire, and expelling it with war and pestilence. And thus he will bring back his world to its former aspect, so that the cosmos will once more be deemed worthy of worship and wondering reverence. And God, the maker and maintainer of the mighty fabric, will be adored by the men of that day with continuous songs of praise and blessing. Such is the new birth of the cosmos. It is a making again of all things good a holy and awe-inspiring restoration of all nature. And it is wrought inside the process of time by the eternal will of the Creator. Egypt, Egypt. Oh, Egypt, Egypt. Egypt.
Oh, Egypt, Egypt, of thy religion nothing will remain but an empty tale. Akira. He's got clout. Yeah, my, my opinion is if, if, if somebody wants to stay home, they should stay home. I say if somebody doesn't want to stay home, they should not be compelled to stay home. That's my opinion. If, if somebody doesn't like that, well, that's my opinion. This notion, though, that you, you, know, you can just sort of send checks out everybody and, and things will be fine is not true, obviously. Some people have this absurd, like, uh, view that the economy is like some magic horn of plenty. Like, it, it just makes stuff. Stuff, you know, whatever, it just, there's a magic horn of plenty, and the goods and services, they just come from this magic horn of plenty, and then if, um, like, if somebody has more stuff than somebody else, it's because they took more from this magic horn of plenty. Now let me just break it to you, the fools out there. If you don't make stuff, there's no stuff. 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 Yeah. So, if you don't make the food, you don't process the food, you don't transport the food, medical treatment, you know, teeth fixed. There's no stuff. I would become detached from reality. You can't just legislate money and solve these things. If you don't make stuff, there is no stuff. If you don't make stuff, there's no stuff. If you don't make stuff, there's no stuff. If you don't make stuff, there's no stuff. If you don't make stuff. There is no stuff. Obviously, we'll run out of the stores. We'll run out of the. You know, If you don't make stuff, there's no stuff. If you don't make stuff, there's no stuff. If you don't make stuff, there's no stuff. If you don't make stuff, there is no stuff. When all men doubt you But make allowance for their doubting too If you can wait And not be tired by waiting Or being lied about Don't deal in lies Or being hated Don't give way to hating And yet Don't look too good Nor talk too wise If you can dream And not make dreams your master If you can think And not make thoughts your aim If you can meet triumph and disaster And treat those two in just the same If you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken Twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools Or watch the things you gave your life to broken And stoop and build them up with worn out 
start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone. And so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. So there's a line in the New Testament where Christ says that no one comes to the Father except through him, which is a hell of a thing for anyone to say. I am the way and the truth and the life. That's another one. Here's the idea. It's as if there's a spirit at the bottom of things that is involved in the bringing to being of everything. People talk about evolution as a random process, but that's not true. The mutations are random, but the selection mechanisms are not random. What are the selection mechanisms? Human females are very sexually selective. That's why you have twice as many female ancestors as male ancestors. So the male failure rate for reproduction is twice that of the female. How is it that males succeed differentially? Females reject. They reject on the basis of what? And the answer is, well, it's something like competence. How is competence defined? Well, men put themselves in hierarchies and they vote on each other's competence. Let's say you decide to follow the best leader in a battle. Well, then you don't die. Like he might get all the women, but you don't die. So at least you're still in the game. And it might be the same if you're following the greatest hunter. And the greatest hunter wouldn't be the person who was best at bringing down the game. It would be the person who was best at bringing down the game and sharing it and organizing the next hunt and all of that. What that means to some degree is that there's a spirit of masculinity shaping the entire structure of human evolutionary history. 
That's what that means. It's the spirit of positive masculinity that manifests itself across epochal ages, millions of years perhaps. And it actually has shaped our consciousness. Actually. It's like the essential spirit of all the great men who defined what greatness constituted. That's a spirit. Well, that's a purely biological explanation. Well, that's God. God is the highest value, highest value. in the hierarchy of the hierarchy. values. God is how we imaginatively and collectively represent the existence and action of consciousness across time. That's God. God is that which selects among men in the eternal hierarchy of men. That's God. God is that which eternally dies and is reborn in the pursuit of higher being and truth. But then there's another possibility too, which is that that's actually reflective of a deeper metaphysical reality that has to do with the nature of consciousness itself. I think that's true, is I believe the biological case, and I believe the biologically reductive case, but I don't think that exhausts it. There's a metaphysical layer underneath that that the biology is a genuine reflection of. And that's the macrocosm above and the microcosm below. We are really reflective, including in our consciousness, of something about the structure of reality itself. And that might involve whatever it is that God is. Well, that's God. God is the future to which we make sacrifices. God is the voice of conscience. That's God. God is the source of judgment and mercy and guilt. That's God. God is what calls and what responds in the eternal call to adventure. Do you know of Akira the Dawn? No, no. Oh, well, you have to do your research.